Yesterday morning, uh, I disappeared off the stage briefly for an interview with Radio New Zealand, and everybody thought it was because I left that the uh, projector wouldn't work then. So, uh, that of course was supposed to be Glyn's job, and then uh, Glyn had to be on stage because Andrew and Suzanne can't be with us because of uh, the three-month-old three uh, being in hospital and other illnesses in the family. So we expect Andrew back this afternoon. Um, meanwhile, while I was on Radio New Zealand, I told uh, them about the fantastic people we have lined up to keynote here. And in the process of that, I got a bit flustered, and uh, I said that Biella was a sociologist. So uh, <laughs> I have to apologise for that. It's not true. Biella is an anthropologist, and having studied both subjects at university myself, I should have known better. M maybe I would have got better marks if I had of. <laughs> Fortunately, Biella's a bit thick-skinned, and she tells me that she's been mistaken for worse things. Uh, at New York University, where she is an assistant professor in the Department of Media, Culture and Communication, she is regularly mistaken for a student. <laughs> and it is this ability to blend in so well that gives Biella an extended capacity to understand a culture from the inside. Just like us, she has inhabited those twilight hours on IRC between bedtime and breakfast. And also, just like us, she's done it in her pyjamas. It's, it's tough to build a, a career in modern anthropology, going out and conducting ethnographic research on site. But Biella's fundamental laziness has brought her to study a community where on site did not require her to get out of bed. <laughs> and where she could... <laughs> where she could wake up gently over an espresso in a suitably equipped cafe. It, and uh, given such a background, it seems fitting that she would turn up in person in Wellington, where many of us regularly also don't want to get out of bed. And we, when we do, it's usually in order to visit a cafe. And it's my sincere hope that she finds it all so seductive that she finds she just needs to pop back to New York and tidy up a few loose ends before settling here permanently. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, Biella's research into online software development communities is so interesting that she finds herself in demand worldwide, and we're all looking forward to the release of her book, Coding Freedom, Hacker Pleasure and the Ethics of Free and Open Source Software. I've had the pleasure of seeing Biella speak before and have also been party to her crowdsourcing the proofreading of occasional chapters of her book, so I was particularly pleased when she agreed to come and present to us here. As part of her responsibilities at New York University, Biella teaches a course on computer hackers, probably the only one of its kind in the world. So I'd like you all to join with me in thanking her for ditching that class to be here with us. Thanks, Biella. That's a great introduction. Thank you. All right. First of all, can people hear me okay? No, not yet. All right. How about now? All right, great. Well, first of all, I'd really like to thank the um, organizers of the conference for inviting me here. LCA is quite a legendary conference, and it's quite far away, so I'm really glad I was able to make the trip at least once, and thanks for that great introduction. It's true, I am lazy. It's true, I'm often confused with students in the hallways, um, but I also very much love studying what I do, and I hope to give you a small sense of that today. So. Today I'm going to be talking about free software's unique historical contribution to the politics of intellectual property law. We're going to be taking a walk down memory lane. And the basic upshot of my talk, um, as the title indicates, is that these are the best and worst of times when it comes to IP. And this is a state of paradox, and by the end of the talk I'll be talking a little bit more about why this is so important. But before I get to the meat and the heart of my talk, I thought it would be nice to give people a sense of what anthropology even is. Now, in New Zealand, anthropology is a common fixture. Um, I even have friends and classmates who came here to study the Maori. But when it comes to the study of geeks, um, anthropology is not so common. And I believe for LCA, this is the first time that an anthropologist has been invited to come talk here. So how is it that I, an anthropologist who did study originally something uber-traditional, come to study you all? 
And this happened around 1998, 1999, so for a decade now. However, my first exposure to um, free and open source software came accidentally and very briefly. One day, while I was an undergraduate um, in university, I trotted over to my friend's um, college dorm room, and I, I found him in a state of pleasure and trance. He was salivating over a CD bearing the name Slackware. At the time, I was so perplexed. I was like, how can a CD cause so much joy? Now, he was in such a trance state. He didn't bother to tell me a thing about free software, nor did he bother to tell me that one of the reasons he was so pleased was that prior to the CD, installing Linux was a bit of a technical deathmatch. And it wasn't only the sort of hell of configuration, it was the grueling task of downloading Linux for over a week while you were cursing your baud rate. So at the time, my reaction came in the form of a silent question. Seriously? Why is he so into this CD? At the time, I actually didn't ask him anything more about it. We left, we went to play some squash, and that was it. Now, two years later, I started to have a kind of growing interest in patents and medicine. And so this very friend decided to sit me down and tell me about something called the copyleft. And I'm glad I was sitting down because at the time it really struck me. It was really inspiring. It was really awful. Awe. I was in awe. It wasn't awful. I was in awe. Um, I was just so struck because intellectual property basically had just grown stronger, bigger, more powerful, and all of a sudden there was this working alternative. So I soon found myself glued to the internet. I had just gotten DSL, which helped, and basically after a few months it became utterly clear that if I wanted to ever finish my PhD, which in my department the average is um, 12 years, which is pretty embarrassing, um, I would have to take a serious intellectual U-turn away from religious healing in Guyana, South America, and head to the internet, to the land of the geeks. And that's precisely what I did. But my dissertation committee, when I first told them, well, they were a little um, skeptical. And they were a little skeptical because, as we all know here very well, the minute you utter the word hacker, there are certain stereotypes that percolate into people's minds such as this one. <laughs> so once I convinced my advisors, my uh, dissertation committee members, that I, hackers didn't want to blow my family or their family to smithereens, they gave me the seal of approval, and I went ahead and I did field work. Although this is obviously not me, but this is what um, normally percolates to people's minds when they learn about anthropology, although many people confuse it with archaeology, which is Indiana Jones, and even paleontology, which is the study of dinosaurs. So um, for those that may not know, fieldwork mandates total cultural immersion. Um, it entails participation, watching, listening, recording, data collecting, interviewing, sometimes learning different languages, and asking many, many questions. You kind of dedicate your life to a, a group of people or a subject. Now that description is true, but it's pretty sanitized and it's pretty idealized because frankly, the start of field work is nothing but intimidating. Um, showing up to a group of people you seek to formally study, which in my case was an install fest, and letting them know that you plan on staying for months, possibly years, is a really difficult first introduction to pull off. It neither helped in my case that when I first started doing field work, even though everyone was talking in purported English, I couldn't understand a damn thing. The technical jargon was like the fog, thick, constant, impenetrable in the place I did most of my field work, which was San Francisco. So sure, when I um, started field work, I found it slightly intimidating. But over time, I found it less intimidating and actually, pretty soon, I found it not intimidating at all. Um, in fact, field work became incredibly fun. I was having a blast. And actually, I felt like I was scamming the world, getting funded to do a PhD on free and open source software. 
so basically after that kind of initial awkwardness melted away, I learned the jargon, I became comfortable, I was psyched. But there was still a huge question that remained for me. Now it was clear that geeks were pretty smart and clever. It was also even more clear that they really liked to improve things and make things better. I'm just thrilled I live in the era where I can use lol caps in my slides. But that was the problem. I thought perhaps they're just computer fanatics, right? And that really there's not the type of cultural meat that anthropologists like to sink their teeth into. So, so I was just, you know, a little bit concerned. But more than anything else, it was the abundance of humor among geeks, which included informal joking. It included language punning. It included Easter eggs in code. It included humorous computer languages like intercal that assured me that there was a cult, that there was cultural substance to grab onto and also to dissect. For as the philosopher Simon Critchley has so eloquently put it, the extraordinary thing about humor is that it returns us to common sense by distancing us from it. And by common sense, he means the kind of deep sensibilities, assumptions, and values that make up the often invisible world of culture. Now, one of my favorite bits of humor that I spend a considerable amount of time dissecting in my work um, concerns cabals, of course, as well as their supposed lack. There is no cabal. As I soon came to learn, many geeks, whether in the golden age of Usenet or today, and I noticed that there's a, a, a network, a cabal network, which I couldn't get onto. Um, I'm not part of it. Um, they seem to joke an awful lot about cabals, a humorous accusation used in part to remind those who've been granted power or who hold power that they should behave openly, transparently, and in consultation with others, leveling the playing field by which others can contribute to the technical common wheel. Unfortunately today, I'm not going to talk any further about hacker cabals or hacker humor. You're going to have to read my book, which is currently undergoing serious beta testing. My publisher is pretty unhappy that it's vaporware, but it will be coming soon. We just take an awful long time as academics. But I am going to talk, and now I'm shifting to the heart of my talk, I am going to talk about a less humorous but real world cabal, the intellectual property cabal, whose most recent incarnation can, can be located in the following treaty, ACTA, um, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement. Okay. As our good friends at the Electronic Frontier Foundation have written, ACTA is intended to set new global IP enforcement norms above the current international standards in the agreement on trade-related aspects of international intellectual property trips. States are negotiating ACTA with unprecedented secrecy. A lawsuit brought by the EFF and public knowledge resulted in the release of 159 pages of information but 1,362 were withheld under national security classifications. Quite cabalish. Among other provisions, um, nations involved in ACTA left developing countries out of the negotiations, and of course they have a lot to lose. And most famously and problematically, they have certain provisions for the global uh, regulation of internet traffic, as well as internet termination laws, such as the three strikes laws being considered in France. So taken alone, ACTA and its unfortunate rich ancestry, which includes the DMCA in the United States, the Sony Bono Act, TRIPS, uh, weak fair use principles, the patenting of life, software algorithm, software algorithms, this ancestry would make for a pretty depressing state of affairs as it concerns the politics of, in, of intellectual property law. But indeed, it's largely because of free software that we in fact can not only feel pessimistic, but that we should also feel optimistic about the current state of affairs. For never before has there, have there existed such profound um, and robust alternatives to the global tangle of IP provisions. So it is for this reason that when people ask me what's most politically significant about free software, 
I usually don't pepper my response with a sort of optimistic rah-rah story. Instead, I respond with the literary quotes, the memorable opening lines from Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities, written in 1859. In this book, Dickens compares two European countries under turmoil, France, pre-revolutionary France, and England. He, play, he paints a very unflattering picture of both countries, but he also leaves the readers with a ray of hope, for those times were ones of renewal and rebirth. So the book opens in this way. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. So although these words describe a time, a place, so distant from our own, the duality of hope, of despair, of light, and of darkness is one that I think aptly and absolutely captures the contemporary moment. Never before have we been so subject to one global and powerful regime, and yet never before in the short history of IP have we been graced with such robust possibilities, best represented by free and open source software, and the efforts it has inspired from Creative Commons to the open access movement. We should feel both optimistic and pessimistic about the current state of affairs. Now, how did we get here? Why is it important to emphasize this paradox? I hope to start answering these questions by taking you down historical memory lane. And what I'm gonna do is talk about the rise of free software in relationship to the rise of the global politics of intellectual property. And what we're gonna see is that there kind of two related but independent streams that over time kind of intersected and clashed. I'm gonna concentrate in this history on three periods, 1984 to 1991, even though obviously you can go further back to tell the story of free software. The second period is 1992 to 1997, and then 1998 to 2004. I would like to go into 2004 to the present, but unfortunately I'm not gonna have the time, but if I were to talk about it, I would talk a little bit about Web 2.0 discourse and how that's been both a kind of boon and barrier to alternative possibilities in IP law. I'm gonna emphasize over and over again <clears throat> battles over culture. You're gonna see culture come up all the time. Um, it's gonna come out of the words of Richard Stallman. It's gonna come out of the, the mouth of um, the CEO of Time Warner. And then at the end of the talk, I'm gonna once again revisit this question of historical paradox and talk about why it's so important to emphasize for nurturing future political action. So to narrate this history, a natural place to start is of course with Richard Stallman, a man who needs no introduction to this audience. Many, however, have not perhaps seen him during a more youthful period when he was he described himself as one of the happiest hackers on earth, where he, housed at MIT, he hacked to his heart's content with very few barriers. By 1984, his happiness was crushed and it was replaced with despair. And Glenn Moody, who's um, giving a keynote in a few days, uh, his book, Rebel Code, covers this history quite well. I really re recommend that book. All right, now I'm going to show a video, also from a more youthful period, where Stallman describes what it's like to lose the access to the blueprints of software. Oop. Can they turn it up? All right, let's try it again. Can I what? Hmm. It's 
it's not set up. Well, I'll play the video after the talk. But, yeah, I could try that. It's not very loud here. Yeah. Oh, well, after the many, many, many hours I spent on this the tragedy. I will play the video. It's a great video where he talks about, basically, he says how he feels um, downtrodden and resigned. Basically, that's what he feels like when it's like to lose access to um, the blueprints of software. At the time, though unmarried, he also would tell strangers that he met on the street that his wife had died, by which he meant the culture of computer programming. Um, and this is covered in Stevie Levin's, Levy's book, Hackers. Um, he also told Stephen Levy that I'm the last survivor of a dead culture and I don't really belong in the world anymore. In some ways, I feel like I ought to be dead. However dire Richard Stallman's prediction about hacking was, it actually proved to be wrong. Computer hacking actually experienced nothing short of a cultural renaissance. And it flourished in part, but only in part, because Stallman initiated a political movement, we might say a virtual land trust, for the creation and preservation of software, now called free software. What is interesting to think about is how and why Richard Stallman was successful in creating this virtual land trust in a period that has been ominously described by legal scholar James Boyle as the second enclosure movement, by which he means the enclosure of ideas behind the walls of intellectual property. How is it, in other words, that software was able to escape the second enclosure? Now, obviously, there's many components to this. I can talk probably about four hours until everyone's asleep um, about why this is the case. But the brief answer is that it was great timing, in fact, really, really good timing. Um, if Stallman had been born five to ten years later, perhaps we wouldn't all be here today. Um, if you look back at the history, and here I'm cribbing a little bit from the work of Christopher Kelty, who's written a wonderful book called Two Bits. He has this great chapter on the very genesis of the copyleft. I can't recommend it enough. If you look back at this history, when Richard Stallman started his crusade, basically saw, um, patents and copyrights had not entered the realm of software. Many geeks and hackers were kind of unaware of how this legal material worked. Stallman didn't even turn to the law to create what he called his Emacs commune. The law was the damn problem. Why are you going to go to the law? It was only after a big kind of copyright dispute with James Goslin over Emacs that Stallman decided that he needed to fight fire with fire. So in this period, even though intellectual property was strong, it was growing, it yet had to substantially enter the realm of software, which was great timing. In fact, 1984, the very same year that Richard Stallman first started to write free software, a year before he founded the Free Software Foundation, was the very year that corporations formed three very powerful new trade associations that pushed for the wholesale adoption of intellectual property through the back door of free trade. In this year alone, three, the following three associations were formed. The Intellectual Property Committee, the International Intellectual Property Alliance, and the Software Publishers Association. Number two carries with it some special stars because, in fact, it's an umbrella organization representing the MPAA, the RIAA, and the Business Software Alliance, at least at the time. I'm actually not sure if that's the case anymore. So between 1984 and 1991, there was two opposing trends formed in the law. Um, and though they were related, they existed independently of each other. One was free software, which was small, seemingly insignificant in the grand scheme of things. A political movement based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, focused almost entirely on software. It was so geeky and esoteric, only the geekiest of geeks and hackers knew of it. The other trend was a global endeavor pushed by corporate giants, Eli Lilly, Microsoft Universal Studios, that sought to define, demand, and export one global model of intellectual property for the world. Now, the next stage of this history, obviously I'm going very um, quickly, occurred between 1992 and 1998. And basically what we see is both the world of free software and IP become more global 
diverse, and especially public. So as we all know, when Richard Stallman started to write free software, um, he kind of tightly controlled um, the writing of the software. Many geeks knew of free software, and some of them identified immediately with this world. Others were just like, ooh, cool, free as in beer. I've got free beer software. Um, and it would take a kind of social and political accident by the name of Linus Torvalds and his hobby project, the Linux Kernel, to transform what was a small political crusade into a techno-social movement embraced by many more. So as we know, Linus acted as the informal leader, and another really important element was that there was um, PCs were cheaper, people were getting internet at home, so you, you guys didn't have to work at the university lab or at work anymore, so there was a kind of move towards domestic labor, which was really important in the constitution of these projects. Now, what interests me most about this period was the emotion of bewilderment, a state of surprise captured really nicely by this low cat. As we all might recall, the existence of Linux shocked the heck out of everyone. Though collaboration was certainly always a part of hacking, people didn't think it could scale, nor did they think it could happen so virtually. This moment of collective surprise created the conditions for social reflexivity. It allowed developers to rethink what collaboration entailed. It worked to realize in a much broader capacity the virtues for sharing and collaboration that Richard Stallman had theorized in his manifesto. To state in slightly more theoretical terms, with the emergence of Linux, we see what political philosopher Hannah Arendt has described as the character of startling unexpectedness which is inherent in all beginnings. What Arendt conveys is that because at some level the present is always in the process of becoming, it's characterized by some degree of elasticity, underdetermination, which invites experimentation, and in some cases, even the birth of something new. So much of the early history of free software precisely existed in such a state. It required a level of open experimentation on the part of developers and hackers, Solomon's intentional politics of resistance, however crucial to the viability of software freedom, was incomplete without the participation of social actors also willing to embrace, jump into what only existed incipiently. Now, as we also know, this was also the period when the political element of free software found its pragmatic, apolitical counterpart, its apolitical cousin. Linus saw the pragmatic value of the copyleft, he turned to it, he combined his kernel with the GNU tools, but he steered clear from the political message. But even if Linus himself, the person, was uninterested in the ethical principles of the project, Linux the project, Linux the object, led to a deepening, a proliferation to the ethical principles of free software. More than any other project, it also inspired so many others to follow suit. This was the era when you see the proliferation of volunteer associations. Debian in 1993, Apache in 1995, KDE in 1996, and GNOME in 1997, just to take a few examples. Now, finally, this was the period where there was another transformation. I've actually written quite a bit about this if people are interested when programmers were becoming far more legally literate. Again, if you look back to the 80s, people were kind of clueless about the law. By the 90s, people were becoming pretty proficient about the law. So if code is law, as one very famous lawyer has put it, which is Lawrence Lessig, saying that law and code have many similarities, and uh, geeks and hackers are knee-deep in code, fighting, improving, debugging, and especially at times cursing code, it also makes sense that the learning the law comes with some degree of facility. It's easy for you guys compared to other people to learn at least some technical component of the law. It doesn't mean people in the room would make good lawyers. Um, and so coding is such an interesting conduit because it's a kind of craft competency. It's a cultural competency that eventually translates into legal capacity, which is political strength and vitality, given that the law is a kind of net in modern nation states. You can barely escape it. 
So in this period, we start to see the creation of a profound legal consciousness among hackers that would eventually come to butt heads with other trends in intellectual property law. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let me now talk about some of the IP developments that occurred between 1992 and 1998. Now, again, there's a lot that could be said, and I'm just going to limit myself to a few points. So in this period, probably the most unprecedented thing that happened was that trade associations started to work with federal and international law enforcement agencies to strike against so-called pirates and hackers. This was made possible because in 1992 in the United States, uh, some copyright infringements were deemed felonies. So you could argue and justify the inclusion of law enforcement agencies. Okay, another interesting development had to do with the moral campaigns that really freaking proliferated in this um, era on the radio, in posters, in the news, and so on and so forth. So they launched far more aggressive moral education campaigns about the evils of piracy and the threats of infringement to culture, as we'll see in a moment. So to give you two examples, I'm going to read a quote um, from Richard Parson, who was the CEO of Time Warner. And this is what he said about violation of IP to an LA Times reporter in the early 1990s. And probably some of you have heard this quote. He says, this is a profound moment historically. This isn't just about a bunch of kids stealing music. It's about an assault on everything that constitutes the cultural expression of our society. If we fail to preserve and protect our intellectual property system, the culture will atrophy, the very thing that Solomon was concerned with. And corporations won't be the only ones hurt. Artists will have no incentive to create. Worst case scenario, the country will end up in some sort of cultural dark ages. That's Mount Doom, of course, here in New Zealand. Okay, that's the dark ages. All right, so the, the next example is a little bit more current and it's probably the most extreme and it has to do with the equation of terrorism with piracy. We know those go together uh, like peanut butter and chocolate. So, um, and this was obviously made possible by the war and terror in the United States. Okay, finally this was the period where associations pushed aggressively for the inclusion of IP in these trade treaties, most notably TRIPS, which was passed in 1994. It, re um, it represented the most sweeping changes to intellectual property law in its history, um, and it required all member nations to eventually adopt a single standard. Can you guys all hear me still okay? Okay. Um, these included the fact that patents had to be open to all technological fields, which was really contested in Europe with software. The copyright term was modeled on the U.S. 1976 statute. And then, of course, countries could only grant narrowly defined exceptions to copyright terms. Okay, so obviously in this period, IP, IP became restrictive, powerful, but one of the things that also happened as a result is that knowledge about intellectual property became far more of a known quantity, thanks to these kind of ridiculous moral campaigns as well. It became a public issue. Once public, it was also put in the position to be put under critical scrutiny, which is what soon happened, especially once programmers were arrested a few years later, um, which I'm going to talk about in one moment. All right, now I'm going to get to the final period, which in some ways is the most exciting. A lot kind of happened between 1998 and 2004. When it comes to free software, it, um, I'm going to highlight three elements. First, very briefly, let me tell you. Obviously, free software entered the commercial realm more openly and visibly. But what is often not noted, because people are like, this was the period of open source, which is absolutely true. But this was also the period where there was accentuated social and political antagonisms under the DMCA and the arrest of people like Jon Johansson and Dmitry Skilarov. And this, in fact, helped to keep the political fire alive, all the while there was a kind of movement against um, to move away politics. And then finally, um, another final trend is the fact that geeks and hackers were not just learning how to collaborate and build very interesting social institutions that are the free software projects, but they were also um, 
these projects produce what probably is the largest amateur and informal ar army of IP and free speech scholars in the world. There's a lot of you guys. Um, and this, of course, would become crucial later on when there were these antagonisms. Okay, so let me back up now. So this was the period when that festive bewilderment, like that, wow, what is going on, ended, and it was replaced with triumph. Triumph in part because of the fact that free software entered the commercial realm so visibly. Companies like Cygnus and Red Hat were able to grow and provide support and services for free software. As we all remember, in 1998, Netscape released the source code of their browser, causing huge waves in the press because basically this move was just almost heretical uh, in the sense that Silicon Valley technology firms were uh, supposed to keep their crown jewels utterly, utterly secret. Many geeks working um, in Silicon Valley and other parts of the world had been using free software for years and years and years, but often behind their managers' backs. And this was a time where they felt more comfortable telling them yeah, in fact, our multi-million operations are running on Debian. And all of a sudden, this wasn't kind of um, something that was going to shock the hell out of the managers. This was also the period when a group of hackers during a semi-secret powwow in Silicon Valley, most famously Eric Raymond, who pushed this, engaged in kind of a linguistic jiu-jitsu, changing the name Free Software to open source to try to eliminate the kind of message of freedom in order to be more business friendly. It was a move that would prove both contentious and successful and whose effects I think are still with us today. Now, at this time, and this was actually when I really jumped on board, that moment where free became open and there was all these kind of cultural politics of language, it was becoming more visible that I jumped ship and decided to study this. And one of the things that I kind of thought was, okay, the idealism of free software was a thing of the past. The corporate discourse of technical in efficiency and market power was going to be a Goliath in comparison to the eccentric David, Richard Stallman, and those like him who mandated an ethics of software freedom. But in fact, I think the popularity of Linux among hackers, the ability of people to contribute to the growing number of volunteer associations, and its success in the commercial sphere had the effect of rendering visible the underlying ethics of free software to a much larger audience than the Free Software Foundation and Richard Stallman had ever reached. So by making Linux an open source, a household name, and IBM was uh, quite responsible for that. They went kind of crazy all over the states, um, spray painting and chalking things up and getting lots of fines that they could pay for. Many more people learned um, not just about open source, but the ethical foundations sharing freedom and collaboration of free software production. If this was the period that um, free software kind of entered the commercial realm, it was also very much the period where free software started to inspire a bunch of other initiatives, such as Indie Media, which drew partial inspiration. It was kind of independent, but still drew some of its understanding from free software, Wikipedia, and of course, Creative Commons, right? Um, now, I want to make a short little kind of academic point, but I'll try not to make it very jargony, about um, the move towards open source and how it helped free software, how it helped spread the message of collaboration and um, sharing. And it has to do, in part, with something very particular in the United States. There's a kind of very long tradition of what you guys call FUD, uh, Fear, uncertain, Uncertainty, and Doubt, and it's called red baiting. Um, and red baiting goes back decades and decades. We have a really long tradition of it, and it's basically when something is tagged communistic, and in the United States that means the same thing as socialistic for some reason, and it's done as a way to designate whatever object is tagged as communistic as evil, as that which robs Americans of their freedom, and as a way to stop it in its tracks. And again, this goes back to the 30s and 40s, and unfortunately, is still very much with us today. Um, Obama is frequently the target of it, especially with his health care um, mandates. Now, Microsoft obviously made a hearty attempt to exploit this tradition of red baiting 
by naming free software as a communistic cancer, which they did over and over again. And I remember watching this with great anticipation because I think I've seen so many things dismantled by this process of red baiting. And so I was watching to see what would happen. Well, Microsoft failed utterly, which was really surprising to me. And I think it failed in part because of the strong political disavowal coming out of the camp of open source, combined with the political narrowness of the free software camp, a political message that used plain and simple language about helping your neighbor, about not hoarding, it steered clear of anti-capitalist language, and then starting especially in the 1990s, a more common language became that of free speech, which has kind of a strong currency and valence and tradition in liberal democracies. So this is really interesting how free software was kind of immune from red baiting, which I think really helped it spread. Obviously, there was other factors involved. All right, so as Microsoft was trying to sully free software by red baiting it, they were doing so because they were actually quite threatened by it even though in public they were claiming otherwise, even portraying Linux as technically dangerous. Now I'm going to show you one of my favorite examples from a German ad campaign where they portray the Linux logo as mutating from a penguin to a penguin rabbit to a reindeer uh, dog penguin to what I think is a mouse anteater penguin, obviously. And this was a sort of message that this stuff was dangerous for your computers. Now, despite, yeah, it is a little weird. Doesn't, what, what does it say? Does anyone know? Uh-huh. Okay. So despite gate, only doesn't have what? Oh, right. Okay. All right, say it again. An open operating system doesn't only have advantages. An open operating system doesn't only have advantages. It also has penguin and eater mouses. <laughs> that part's not there. All right. So despite his, you know, Gates and the Microsoft's uh, confident proclamations that there was no threat by uh, threat posed by free software. Obviously, we know that the history is different because of the Halloween documents that were released, and this caused a big, like, brouhaha, really exciting. And here is a short snippet to jog your memory that came out of the Halloween documents. OSS poses a direct short-term revenue platform threat to Microsoft, particularly in server space. Additionally, the free idea exchange in OSS has benefits that are not replicable with current licensing models and therefore present a long-term developer mindshare threat. Now, in the short history of free software, the soap opera saga has become one of the most memorable and, of course, was received as one of the most um, ironic instances because, as many people here know, 22 years earlier, in 1976, Bill, wrote, Bill Gates wrote a now famous letter to homebrew hobbyists, basically telling them that unless you don't, unless you use um, uh, copyrights, no one is going to write good software. So this is what he wrote. As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, he, uh, and he was upset that people were pirating, sharing his basic uh, program. As most of the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Hardware must be paid for. But software is something to share. Who cares if the people worked on it get paid? Is this fair? One thing you do is prevent good software from being written. So by the time the Halloween documents were released, most hackers were thrilled at free and open source software. They were very well aware of the existence of two opposing trends in the law. Many were also comfortable with the idea that free software, now open source, was not really about ethics or politics, but simply a superior engineering um, set of methods and techniques. But actions taken by the U.S. Department of Justice, the FBI, the trade associations, and software companies such as Adobe would only magnify the antagonisms and clashes between these two worlds. 
forcing many geeks into the political arena, even in, and if when many didn't necessarily want to. So in 1998, thanks to the lobbying efforts by the copyright industries, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was passed, a restrictive copyright statute which outlawed a number of circumvention technologies, including software. And soon after the law was passed, uh, two hackers and their software, uh, most famously Jon Johansson in DCSS, he obviously wasn't arrested under the DMCA, but because um, he wasn't in the United States, but DCSS was involved in a bunch of lawsuits in the United States. And then eventually Dmitry Skilorov um, was arrested when leaving DEF CON, uh, which I think was a huge mistake. Don't, you know, arrest a hacker at their kind of ritual event. Um, obviously, the FBI does not have good anthropologists working for them. Uh, he was arrested under the DMCA for writing software for Elcom Soft, right? Well, by now, the trade associations were actually very well aware of geeks, open source software, and hackers actually often commenting on them in their press releases. So for those who were involved in fighting patents in Europe, the BSA, the B uh, Business Software Alliance, would mention open source developers in their press releases. After the arrest of Dmitry Skilorov, this is what um, they released. Oh, and by the way, this was uh, a protest in San Francisco, which I went to after his arrest. So this is what the BSA said. They were so pleased. They said, U.S. prosecutors have now obtained the first indictment under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act involving Elcomsoft and its employee, Dmitry Skilorov. This indictment under the DMCA is consistent with a plain reading of the law and with Congress's intention when the law was drafted and enacted in 1998. Law enforcement actions are critical to the BSA's anti-piracy efforts which resulted in over 11 billion in losses to the industry alone. We look forward to continuing efforts in this area. So finally, they feel like something important had come into fruition. So clearly, the BSA was so pleased that the Department of Justice had taken action under the auspices of the DMCA. Less comforting, however, was the fact that this arrest led to some of the most, led to some of the most vibrant hacker protests of the last decade. Indeed, the arrest of Dmitry Skilorov proved a greater boon to the consolidation of the anti-DMCA movement to the idea that code is speech than to the suppression of so-called piracy. And this was really interesting because this was a period where kind of different groups of people, lawyer advocates like Lawrence Lessig, librarians and geeks kind of uh, started a very important conversation with each other. And so here I am kind of at the end of the brief history of the way in which there was these two trends that were independent, partially related, that then over time and currently are just crossed um, and in this sort of antagonistic relationship with each other. This is why we are in a state of historical paradox. And for the next 10 minutes or six or seven minutes, I just have a few concluding thoughts about why it's so important to emphasize this um, dual age. So in 1981, the journalist Tracy Kidder published a book I like to use in my teaching, and it's called The Soul of a New Machine. It's a wonderful book. It provides a commentary on the commercial turn in computing during the late 1970s and early 80s. The book ends quite pessimistically with a programmer, programmer lamenting how managers at large firms have robbed the soul of computing away from them. This is the last line from the book, or the last two lines. It was a different game now. Clearly, the machine no longer belonged to its makers. This was also the period where a bunch of hackers decided to take the jargon file and publish it in print because they thought the lingo and artifacts and world of hacking would die away. And you could read this in one of the prefaces, Guy Steele, in fact is the one that wrote it. So these statements of the death of hacking, of the soul of computing dying, closely echoes the moral sentiments made by other hackers, such as Richard Stallman, about their cultural presence. There is, of course, I hope um, now, I hope now it's apparent 
that there is a historical irony in the fact that all these dire predictions turned out to be false. The death of hacking never materialized. Instead, it underwent a cultural proliferation, a cultural renaissance. On the other hand, these sorts of pessimistic predictions were partially true. This was the period of the second enclosure movement. It was encroaching very quickly on software. And one might say that pessimism was absolutely necessary to ensure the freedom that hackers now enjoy. It was because Richard Stallman was pessimistic. It was because he was deeply disturbed that he took political action. And these actions helped ensure the continued existence of hacking as a craft based on the open exchange of knowledge. Even though Richard Stallman injected an important spirit of resistance, which is still with us today, in later years when free software, when the free software movement exploded, resistance or political intent didn't figure as prominently. Eventually, because of the continued expansion of the second enclosure, there were new threats and restrictions, such as the DMCA, and in the US, the move to patent everything under the sun. That's a quote, everything under the sun. This continued expansion, especially when the new statutes at times directly clashed with the ideals, the philosophies, and especially the bodies of programmers, as it did with DCSS and Jan Johansson, it helped to keep the political fire alive, even when free software was otherwise being gutted of its political message. More recently, there have been many new developments, but this dual age of hope and darkness is still very much with us today. Free software and open source has continued to inspire many to open the gates of knowledge. For example, Peter Suber of the open access, of the scholarly open access movement just published a blog entry uh, talking about the previous year, 2009. And this is what he says. 2009 was open access year in the Netherlands, but it might have been open access year worldwide. The growth on every front was extraordinary. Threats, however, still loom large, perhaps even larger than the late 1990s. The IP cabal is well and alive, threatened not simply by new technologies, but by new philosophies of remix, of free culture, of free speech, of free software. ACTA, which I opened with, being simply the most visible incarnation of a much larger train of events and statutes that are likely to continue in the future. These threats are real, and demands the type of vigilance, action, and activity that has marked free software in times past, from its birth to the vibrant protests to demand the release of Johansson and Skilleroff. For someone who cares about the politics of open access, who believes that the fences of the second enclosure should be shorter or weaker, or even at times entirely torn down, it's imperative to highlight the ironies and the paradoxes from this history especially the fact that these are the best and these are the worst of times. To help explain what I mean and to really end, I promise, I'm going to turn to a very obscure American public intellectual by the name of Randolph Bourne, who died an early death at the age of 32, but left an impressive number of writings, one of which was a powerful essay on irony. In the essay, he implores his readers to steer clear from the twin pillars of feeling just optimistic or just pessimistic. He writes this in terms of what he calls clear-sighted irony. And I'm going to read a quote from him. Irony is thus a cure for both optimism and pessimism. For if the optimist is blind, the pessimist is hypnotized. But clear-sighted irony sees that the world is too big and multifarious to be evil at heart. Something beautiful and joyous lurks even in the most hapless. A child's laugh in the dreary street, a smile on the face of a weary woman. It is this saving quality of irony that both optimists and pessimists miss. If we apply this insight to the question of politics, there's some important lessons I think that can be drawn. I think it's the feeling, the dual feeling of pessimism and optimism, of despair and hope, that characterizes so much emotional labor of ethical and political engagement. It is dissatisfaction with the current state of affairs, a feeling of pessimism, which sparks the desire for change, for a better world. But without the concomitant feeling of optimism, the pessimism can smolder and overburden the political will.
the joys and pleasures of politics, of creating stuff you love to create, is absolutely necessary. So to end, free software might be posed as something more complicated than a simple binary. It's not just hypnotically pessimistic nor hopelessly optimistic, but rather it transcends this binary in what Randolph Bourne called clear-sighted clear irony. A vision of the world that lurks in the most hapless place. Among our overly complicated legal frameworks, our oppressive intellectual property systems, and most importantly, among the misguided assumptions that there are no alternative possibilities. Lurking in these shadows, encompassing a much more complicated and beautiful saving quality, we have an actual functioning alternative that both the pessimists and optimists miss. So with that, I have nothing more to say for the formal part of the talk. Um, I'll just open it up to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Biela. And uh, very much enjoyed that. Oh, thanks. And uh, here's a bottle of fiasco wine. wine to take home with you. Great. And uh, does anybody have any questions? We just have a few minutes, if at all. Um, yeah. I'm just, I see under the, a couple of the title slides, uh, you had H.G. Wells' um, first man on the moon in right. Czech. Uh, that looked like it was on ticker tape. Where's, what's the reference there? Uh, I actually just like how it looks. So, <laughs> unfortunately, I, I should... <laughs> Before this talk, I actually met with a designer a little bit to improve my slides because academics have some of the worst slides in the world. And so I just spent a little bit of time. But it's this amazing um, designer who has a blog and actually violates copyrights all the time because he scans graphics and, and, and kids' pictures books and all sorts of interesting books from around the world that have amazing graphics and throws it on his blog. But um, I, I wish I had a fancier answer than it's just pretty. <laughs> From a book cover. A checkbook, yeah. That kind of rings a bell. Oh, yeah, the video, yeah, no, no. Um, proponents of software freedom are, of course, not the only people who are concerned about... Oh, wait, uh, can you speak up a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Uh, pro proponents of software freedom are not the only people, uh, as we know, uh, who are concerned about the intellectual property regime. Um, whenever there's a major international economic meeting that uh, covers intellectual property or a new development, we will, in, at least in the quality media, uh, hear commentary from uh, critics of uh, that regime uh, who are concerned about uh, the uh, patenting of the genetic material uh, taken from uh, farmers in third world countries who are concerned about uh, the drug uh, patents and their impact on the, um, the availability of drugs to those who need them and we'll get, uh, at least in the quality media, we'll get a commentary from uh, an expert such as Vandana Shiva um, criticising what the uh, uh, purveyors of intellectual property are doing. Uh, these kinds of uh, criticisms uh, have, and the, the movements and the activists uh, engaged in them are, seem to be so, uh, entirely disconnected from the world of free software advocacy and I'm wondering to what extent you think that in order to bring about uh, legal and social and political change uh, there will need to be uh, or indeed there's a possibility of some kind of coalition of interests across these various concerns. That's a great question. I mean there's obviously um, different types of groups of people who are concerned with intellectual property who are more or less in conversation with each other. They're definitely not enough in conversation with each other. They're definitely, um, and this has been really a development only in the last three to four years, the rise of certain brokers um, 
such as the Access to Knowledge movement that comes out of Yale University that has brought together many of the actors in these different types of movements, right? Um, and absolutely, I mean, one of the things I'm really interested in is how we can take people's pleasures, right? So you guys all like to hack. Um, so you should hack, like that's your focus. Um, and then have that be part of a broader coalition or a federation where other groups of people like doctors who are interested in medicine and so they're focused on patents, right? So you get kind of the joy of your labor and then you have a kind of coalition or federation with different groups. I think that's the real secret to making a strong politics. It's exploiting kind of the particular and then connecting it with something that goes beyond the particular. So I would say it has started, it definitely has started with groups like Access to Knowledge. Um, but it is tough to build those coalitions because people don't often feel like they're part of that whole movement. Whereas when it comes to free software, why it's so strong, or I think it's so strong, is because people here feel like I'm an open source developer, right? I mean, that's part of your identity. So how can you create coalitions that exploit people's sense of identity but also go beyond that, in a sense. So I think that's uh, an interesting political trick to think about. Oh, we have the video. We'll run the video, okay. and then I've got a couple of announcements to make. So Thanks hopefully everyone. we'll get some sound this time. Here's Richard Stallman. ...house, and the basement was locked, and only the original building contractor had the key. If you needed to make any change, repair anything, you had to go to him. And if he was too busy doing something else, he'd tell you to get lost, and he'd be stuck person's mercy and you become downtrodden and resigned that's what happens when the blueprints to a computer program are kept secret by the organization that sells it and that's the usual way things are done downtrodden and, resigned. and apparently Richard often speaks without moving his lips like that so <laughs> um, okay so a couple of announcements uh, first of all uh, Vic Oliver uh, is not sure where his uh, laptop satchel is. It's a grey one with a broken strap, and it's carrying some medication in it that he's got one day's supply left. So if you do see a, a laptop satchel with a broken strap around the venue, can you um, take it down to the, um, the registration desk and, and hand it to them uh, there? That would be fantastic. Thanks very much. The other thing is uh, we have morning tea now in the Town Hall Auditorium in the Symphony Cafe. Um, the Symphony Cafe will also be open for lunch later on and they'll open the doors out into the square where apparently there's some sunshine out there. Well, you, you can't tell from being in here, of course. Um, so th that'll, that'll be uh, you know, a, a good place to go for lunch today. Uh, I think that's everything. Thanks and thank you, Biela.